Welcome to our Camogie Coach webinar series. This is the first of our four part series. We hope that each webinar will give you the coach insights and practical takeaway ideas that you can bring to your own coaching practice. Our first webinar is using games to develop fundamentals with Colin Crowley. Colin is currently GDA with Cork GEA and founder of the Coach in the Game platform. The platform that shares ideas on coaching in Gaelic games. To date, the platform has attracted over 11,000 followers. Have your pen and paper close by and enjoy the learning. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to Niall and the Camogie Association for the opportunity to present here to, to tonight's V. Um, and I suppose the topic I'm going to be talking about is using games to develop fundamentals. And I suppose with this, all I'm trying to do really is challenge you and the thoughts that you might have already on how you can use games to, to develop fundamentals. So I suppose I'm a big believer that games are a, are a key way of developing developing players, uh, ensuring kids stay and play with the, with, with Komogi, and also that it will aid their development as players going forward. So very simple, what is a game? Um, to me, a game is something that's fun. There's a competitive element involved in it. There, it's unstructured, and what I mean by that is it, it can go a bit all over the place, so it's not just straight lines. There's a winning element involved, um, and obviously where there's a winning, there's a losing. There's a scoring elements in some factor, and again, it's fun. And that is a game to me. Um, I suppose some people would be able to believe that a game, or the thought that a game is a match, and a game isn't a match. A game can be any variation of things, and hopefully as I go on through the presentation, I'll be able to share that with you. So what a, what a coach wants versus what a child needs. Sometimes a coach, uh, especially novice coaches, and what I mean by novice coaches, coaches that are only beginners. They're maybe one, two, three years into the system of coaching and they might only be working with, their, with an under eight group. What a coach sometimes feels they need is, is high structured activities. So they want that the parents looking in from the sideline are going, oh yeah, they're that column, he's very, very impressive. Yeah, he's got cones all set up. He's at all the training session organized and all the coaches know what they're doing. And it's very organized looking and there's a lot of straight lines or drills and stuff like that. But sometimes what a child needs is actually a completely different side of things. So as I said, well, I go a bit of unstructured, a bit of fun and stuff like that. So as I'd say with straight line drills, same thing I always say is that if you go into a shop and there is two two cashiers open and one cashier has one person waiting and the other cashier has five five people waiting, which cashier would you go to? And I'd like to think most of us would go to the person with one cashier, with waiting for one person because we want to be quicker. We don't like standing in queues. So the same with kids, they don't want to be standing in queues waiting to touch the ball in training sessions. So this is just something I came across last summer. Um, and it's, it's Kermit, and I suppose Kermit, for probably my generation, we're all familiar. Maybe the kids, the younger kids of today mightn't be as familiar with him. But he said one quote that, that kind of stuck with me as a coach, and it was, the child, the mind of a child is a beginner's mind. And for them, every day is fresh, stimulating, and leads somewhere special and surprising. I suppose from a coaching perspective, what that says to me is that if a child has this whole world in front of them, why are we limiting them in what they can do? And I suppose Cormac is looking at a full life, but as a coach, if we stick them into straight line drills when they could be doing something different and working on other skills at the same time, why are we inhibiting that kind of imagination with them, if nothing else? So it's just something that I thought was a very good quote. And I think, I think you might be able to, if you kind of keep that at the back of your mind when you're coaching, it might just help you uh, go towards a games, more games based and drill based type activities. Okay. So things to consider. I'm just going to run through this really quickly. Um, fundamentals for me as well would be the physical movement, um, not just things. So I'm just going to run through this in two minutes, and I'll get onto the, the more skill based stuff then. So things to consider when when designing a warm up. So a warm up, how you start the training session, very first second will set the set the tone for the rest of the of the of the hour. Um, so when can when designing a warm up. Is it fun? Is there increased heart rate? Is there multi-directional movement? If you tick those three boxes, you're on a good place and the kids will enjoy it. So fundamental movement, warm-up games, so games, stuff that I use regularly, 
I'd use chase games such as flush the toilet, under the bridge, turtles stuck in the mud, frogs, which are all a variation of one versus a ratio of one to three with one chasing and three off and playing those kind of chase games. Uh, Bulldog, we're all familiar with. Animal movements, Simon says. Monkey tails, where they use a bib stuck into the, stuffed into the back of their shorts. And cups and saucers, which should be using the cones upside down and stuff like that. Lots of movements in it, lots of multi-directional movement. And all those games are very, very simple. But if a child can move well, then hopefully the skills that they will be trying to learn when they play Kamogi will also come along a little bit easier. So by giving them the base at the start. So just, I suppose, the benefits of being phys physically literate, the ability to move well benefits all sports. So after playing Kamogi, hockey, football, soccer, being physically literate will help all of them. Uh, it's shown to improve academic performance, improve cognitive skills, improve mental health and physical wellness, improve social skills, and it creates a healthy lifestyle balance, uh, habits. So when I talk about stuck in the mud or chase games, what, how do they actually resemble the game of Komogi? And they're just a list of things, the acceleration, deceleration, agility, balance, coordination, running, jumping, rolling, crawling, sidestep, evasion, teamwork, communication, uh, increased stamina, sprinting, tactical development, etc. Um, and all those things come out of playing a very, very simple, unstructured game. What I mean by unstructured is when we were younger, warm-up consisted of a lap, or maybe a bunch of runs in and out to a to a 21 meter line or something like that. And very structured, but a game like Stuck in the Mud or Bulldog or Flush the Toilet have multi-directional movements, which benefit the fundamental movements that the children are going to need to excel. So simple things of being able to crawl under someone, being able to get down on your knees will help do the jab lift and roll lift as we go on. So using games to develop skills, um, a couple of things that, I, that I, I look out for, and if you can tick each of these boxes when you're designing an activity or a game, it'll be very, very good for you as a coach, and it'll also be very, very good for the child as a player. So one, we want it to be fun. Fun should be the key ingredient with every single thing we do with players. Um, people say, oh, look, you need to get more serious as you get older. You may need to get more serious, but the fun element should never come out of it. If people stop having fun, they will stop having coming, coming down the pitch. And as a coach, you yourself need to have fun as well. It needs to be enjoyable that you're not just going down and putting together a load of drills and it's a chore for you. You have to have fun, but the kids especially have to have fun because if they don't have fun, they won't come back. If the hockey club or soccer club up the road or the ladies football club up the road is more fun, that's where they will veer to. So two, is it engaging? So what I mean by that is... Are the children being challenged cognitively within the activity? So I suppose the, the alternative would be the straight line drill where they must run out, jab lift the ball, run to the back of the line and up the opposite side. It doesn't take any, any that's no challenge except for the skill. So in their mind, are they being challenged? They're not really. We want to be able to get their mind thinking and mind working to help them as a player. Age appropriate. I suppose it's something that we'd see an awful lot with players themselves. So if you've got, let's say, if we've got an under-8 team in the club and we asked a senior Komogi, one or two of the senior Komogi players to come down and coach the team, they mightn't be able to do stuff age-appropriate. So they might do stuff that they did themselves, a training session the day and night before, and it mightn't be appropriate to what the needs of the players are. So all the content should be age-appropriate, and I'll go through that roughly, uh, briefly, before we go on to, the, on to the designing the games. A winning element, so I spoke about this while ago, there has to be a winning element because that will kind of increase the competitive nature and it'll make the kids want it a little bit more. So if we're just doing something for the sake of it, so let's say a drill where we run out and jab lift the ball and we run to the back of the far line, even something like that, if we have five different groups doing it and we say, right, the first group to do it 10 times each wins. All of a sudden, competitive nature, kids will enjoy that a little bit more than just doing it for the sake of it. So... That's a very simple one, um, but you can make it as hard as you want. That the first team to score four goals in a match wins, or four teams to run over through a gate and cones wins, and stuff like that. Skill development. A skill development has to be important at everything. Why are we doing this ex exercise? So a lot of the time, people do drills for the sake of doing a drill, but we need to do it with a purpose. So if we're doing a drill working on, or a game working on jab lifting, we need to be able to say 
this is how it's going to improve our job lift. We're not just doing it for the sake of doing it because we need the whole point of training is for the skill development to improve, to make it more, to relate to matches, so to make them more competent players. And the last one is lots of ball contacts. And what I mean by that is that if you've got 20 balls in a bag when you're doing a jab lifting activity, can we use the 20 balls? Don't just limit yourself to using, all right, we got five groups of four, there's one ball, five balls, that'll do between each group. We can we use the 20 balls so that every child is getting more ball contacts more regularly. And if you can take all of those six things when you're designing an activity or a game, things will get an awful lot easier for you as a coach. And you'd like to think that the improvements you will see should come forward with that. So the core skills are in Komogi, the same as hurling, are, are, are striking. It's the core skill. And an awful lot of the time it's neglected in a training session. And what I mean by that is sometimes when coaches, when we design training sessions, we forget what the purpose is. And in Kwogi, the ability to strike the ball on the ground uh, for probably five, six, sevens, strike a moving ball for sevens, eight, striking the ball on the run and striking the ball from the hand, and then striking the ball from the hand whilst on the run and doing it left and right sides is very, very important. And every training session, there should be a, there should be a part of it built around developing those core skills. So a simple thing of developing, of putting 15 minutes of every training session, of every hour training session should involve striking. And vice versa, same thing if you're coaching football, it should involve kicking. It is the most important skill. If we can't strike the ball, every other skill is kind of negated a small bit. So if I can jab lift the ball brilliantly, but I can't strike the ball, what's the point in jab lifting the ball into the hand? If I can win possession of 50-50 balls brilliantly, but I can't strike the ball, is that, would I be better off learning to strike and getting a bit balanced there? So it's very, very important that all the kids are competent in striking. So, so with that in mind, make sure that you plan every single training session that you're covering the area of striking. And again, that's age appropriate. So ground strike for five, six, sevens, striking a moving ball for six, sevens, striking a ball and run for seven, eights, striking the ball from the hand, eight, nine, tens, and et cetera, as you go up. So just the core skills here, this is something that, that I like to use. And it's something I think I think clubs clubs probably do have, a lot of clubs with, with coaching plans probably do have something like this. But at the age group, if we only introduce a small number of skills. So rather than at under sixes, we're trying to do a frontal block, a frontal ground block, the shoulder clash, dribbling, flicking, roll lift, catching, jab lift, hand pass. We just focus on three skills. And as you can see, if you focus on three skills each year, so let's say the core skill will be there every year. So the core, core skill of striking is going to be there every single year. But the other associate skills, we can build them appropriate to the needs. So in the GA in Go Games, we have under eight down is ground hurling. So there's no point in putting too much emphasis on catching the ball and striking the ball out of hands too young. But if we can ensure that the kids can get the basics right, so let's say at under five, we want to make sure that every child is holding the hurley correctly, every child is competent at dribbling the ball, and every child is able to stop a moving ball. So the technique is correct in that. If that's all we work on for the whole year, along with the ground strike, by the time they move to under six, we've got a nice competency base. So when we move to under six and we're introducing the frontal block, that'll be a little bit easier than trying to do it a year earlier. And we can do the shoulder clash and then ball control such as dribbling, flicking, stopping, moving ball. So as you can see that it goes on and introducing three simple skills a year, you're basically doing a month solid of working on, let's say if you're under eight, we're going to do the jab lift for the whole month of March. That's going to be one of the skills we're going to do in every single training session for the whole of March. And we try to develop it. And we can tell the parents that this is the skill we're working on for this month. Practice this at home with your daughter. So simple things like that might just make it a little bit easier to advance the games. Now, but the other thing with Komogi and, and football uh, is that for every time you practice a skill, there's an associate skill covered as well. So let's say we say it under five. Um, so we're going to just work on the ground strike, grip, dribble and stop and moving ball. When those kids move to under eight, they're still going to be working on a dribble because that's going to be part of whatever game they're playing. They're still going to be working on a ground strike because that will come up in some of, the, some of the activities you plan. And they're going to be stopping and striking the ball. And if I strike the ball to you, I'm working on the ground strike. 
but what are you working on? You're working on stopping a moving ball. Then you'll work on the ground strike and you'll hit the ball back to me. And we might have a dribble in it that if the ball, if you, if you do stop a moving ball and it does get too close to your feet, you might have to dribble it out to get away the ground strike. So we're constantly working on all the skills. We're never going to just negate the skills and say, oh, that's that done. We're never going to use that again. We're always going to work on the new skills, advance the new skills, but we're also going to improve the skills that we've, that we've worked on before. So I'm just going to give you this, um, first of all, the GA learning, uh, learning.ga.ie website is brilliant for resources. Um, this is just a screenshot, so you can see on the left hand side, you got the age grade, you got the four to six to seven to nines, tens to elevens and twelves to thirteens, and or the you would an adult, and it gives all the different types of gaining position and stuff like that. But I just want to take a screenshot of this in that this is striking a ground ball for seven to nine year olds. And there is six activities that are in the, in the activity in the learning.ga website for this. And of the six of them, four of them have got the word drill in it. So basic drill, basic drill, basic drill, basic drill, fun routine and a condition game. Now, what I'm saying, I'm not saying throw this out and start new, start your own little plan, but how can we make a basic drill such as uh, strike it on the ground in pairs. How could we make that into a game? So rather than just taking the drill, and I suppose I'm not a huge lover of the word drill. I think drill is kind of a, it's an army term, it's a bit regimental, and kids much prefer if you say we're going to play a game versus a drill, and if you play the exact same activity, I think their their mindset would be a lot different. But if we can change the drill to make it a bit more game, like using the, the things that I said earlier about being a fun, making it competitive, making a scoring element, all these things will help improve the quality. So use the website, use the learning.ga website to find find activities and then twist them and make them a little bit better to suit the needs of your team. So if you're working with the under 12 team and you want to do the striking, right? Fun routine there, strike underground golf goals, right? How can we make that more of a game uh, for 12 year olds? And I might go, right, you know what? We'll put it competitive. So whoever wins the ball, they've got to strike. So if you look at the the activity there's four golf goals set around four gates set around the pitch and you must hit the ball through the gate and you go to the next one but for under 12s if we say right one versus one whoever wins the ball must take a shot if you score you get to start possession at the next next goal and the other person might stop you so all we're doing is we're making a fun routine and we're making it a little bit more competitive to suit okay so but check out the jail learning.ie website it is full of information but it said everywhere there's a drill have a look at it and say, right, how can I make that again? So what I'm going to do, Witchy, I'm going to go through some more activities on, I suppose, games that I like to play that I think are very beneficial. And then they work on a number of skills with the core skill being, let's say, the target each time. And before I do that, and I'm after talking about drills and I am going to be talking about games, is that it's never black and white. It's never 100% games and it's never 100% drills. There's a gray area in the middle that you need to find that's suitable for your team. So the gray area might be a dark gray if you're working a little bit older, it might be a more of a middle gray with a younger group. But if you're gone completely white or completely black, it mightn't suit the needs. So find the gray area that suits your team because not everyone is the same. And if you're gonna copy what the other groups are doing or what other coaches are doing, that mightn't fit the needs of your group. So find that gray area that suits your team. So. I'm just going to go through some very, very simple games here that I like to use and I'll, I'll explain how I designed them and why I designed them. And you're probably familiar with all of them already. But the first one is No Man's Land. No Man's Land for me is the best game you can ever play with any age group, be it children, adults. Uh, I do it with junior infants in school who are the first time ever holding hurlies. And I'll show you a video of that coming up. But No Man's Land is very simple where you got two teams You've got an area in the middle that's no man's land. Some people like to call it over the river. And you must hit all the balls into the other side. So you've got the yellows. They're going to try to strike all the balls into the red square. The reds, they're going to try, try to strike, strike all the balls into the yellow square. Whichever team has the least amount of balls is the winner. So there's a game. It's fun. It's competitive. There's a scoring element. There's a win to it. And it's fully engaging. Every child will be engaged. And I suppose a question we get asked an awful lot is how does we how do we cater for the very good player and the not so good player? And a game like this is ideal in that what you can do here is you can talk to, to Mary, who is our best player, star player. She's got three older sisters. She's been playing Kamogi since she was two, and she is way ahead of everybody else. And we can tell Mary, right, Mary, we want you to hit 
20 shots with your weak side and then 20 with your strong side. Whereas you might have another girl, Jenny, might be up to very, very front. She might be her first time here. She hasn't got a great swing, but you can work with her and try to help her just get to three or four strikes across. So we're never putting them in a situation where their peers are judging them. We're not putting them in a straight line where there's five of them waiting and Ginny is going over the ball and she's struggling. It's her first time. Confidence is dipping every second that she's there. And Mary is waiting, going, oh, I, want to, I want to go, I want to go. So how can we improve these players together? So a simple game like No Man's Land. And with No Man's Land, there is, I think the last time of counting, we had 41 progressions. So that's the most basic level there is ground hurling, hit the ball into the other side. The, the number 41, or 40, I think it's 40 or 41, is six players, six reds and six white, six yellows on each square. And the, uh, there's a goals behind each square and the six reds must try to gain possession, hit the ball into the opposite square to their red team. The red team must win it and they must try to score on a go and the goals behind them. And vice versa, the yellows, if they get the ball, they pass the ball over to their yellow team. The yellow players over there must try to get the ball and score in the goals. You can do it, as I said, one that I like to do with uh, 10, 19 year old girls. If, if you do have an astroturf or during the summer when the ground is hard, using tennis balls, hitting the ball out of the hand and try to get them to catch the ball after one bounce so that they're going to leave in the ball bounce, but then they're trying to catch it. And that's a nice way to get them into the idea of catching the ball, hitting the ball a little bit higher, move the square or further back. So I'm just going to show you an example of a video that I did in a primary school uh, two years ago. And these are just juniors and seniors. Now, I'd, I'm not too sure if you can hear the noise, but I'll leave it play. No, so with that, with that game, uh, that's no man's land. And I did that with juniors and senior infants in a school in Mid Cork. And it was for a lot of them, it was their first time holding Hurleys. Now, if anyone's wondering why they aren't wearing helmets, we used Hurlogues that day. So the, the soft Hurleys that kids, that babies use. And we used them inside in the schools because we don't have to carry our own helmets. And they're much more user friendly for kids if they do get a bang of it, that they're not going to be hurt. So we used that um, in the school. And straight away, we had uh, 30 kids in the class all swinging hurley and hitting lots and lots of balls. So the benefits for that were they're all going to go away thinking, Mammy, I'm brilliant at hurling the football, at hurling. Can I join the GA club? There's training Friday or Saturday morning. Straight away, we've, we're after catching the kids. They're after doing something that they could all do. Now, the skill level, obviously, because they were beginners, wasn't hectic. Uh, we weren't focusing too much on the grip and swing. We'd like to think that the coaches in the club will be able to find, finesse, finesse, finesse that when they get a chance. But what we did is that we put the kids in a game playing hurling. Traditionally, when I started coaching in primary schools back 13 years ago in Sligo, I had groups of five, one ball, out around a cone, hit it back to the next person. And if I was to do that now with one group versus another group, which group had more fun? I'd like to think the kids in that class had more fun there today. So. Next activity is goal to goal. So again, this goes back to the drill that we were talking about well ago. And I'll just go back um, and how we can alter a drill to suit. And we've got striking on the ground in pairs. So the bottom right, basic drill. So all we did is we are going to move that a little bit and we're going to make it suit what I want. So I want to make sure it's a game, it's competitive. We're pairing them skill with skill. So we got the very, very good kids might be the kids in red. The very, very weak kids might be the kids in blue. And we're going to play goal to goal where they're trying to score on their opponent. Now, again, depending on the age group, depending on the quality, the link, the link to the pitch, how far away the goals are, it all, matter, it, it all moves according to the ability of the players. So you as a coach need to be able to take that into control. So it's not just making all 10 pitches 20 metres long. Some of them are going to be 8 metres long. Some of them are going to be 23 metres long. 
25 meters long. And again, this is where you can set different challenges. You can ask, you can tell the kids in red, you can hit the ball out of the hands if you control the ball or you jab lift the ball into the hand. And the kids in blue who might be the weakest kids. We just want them swinging and hitting the ball regularly and consistently. So nice and simple. And it's a game that what we did is we looked at the GA learning website and we just modified a game that they had or an activity, a drill that they had. We modified it to make it a game. So I said, there's lots of, lots of brilliant activities there. Use them to suit yourself. So goal to goal is a very simple game. Now, if you do get quality um, and there is a high quality and standard, what you can do is change teams every three minutes, change your opponent and they're constantly playing somebody new and they'll have to adjust tactically, right? This person likes hitting the ball high. This person likes hitting the ball low. This person has got a bit of a swerve on the ball. So how they'll react to that will all be very important. So again, rather than just striking the ball over and back from the partner, which would be the traditional drill we'd see an awful lot of, all right, pass the ball to your partner and they're hitting the ball over and back. Now we got a game. They're still hitting the ball over and back, but now they're going to be working on stopping the moving ball. There'll be a bit of dribbling and a bit of competitiveness involved. And they'll probably hit a lot more balls in the same time. So now the only thing with that is have lots of spare balls behind. So they want to win a ball. When a child does score a goal, throw in a new ball straight away. From them. Uh, so it's a very, very simple game. But again, we just took a drill and we modified it into a game. Next one is Rob Dines. This is another one of my favorites and one of the, something I try to do in, in every school that I'm in. And I suppose it can be done, obviously all these, these skills can be done in ladies football as well as, as Camogie. But Rob Dines is, you have four different groups or it could be six groups or it could be two groups and you've got all the balls in the middle and they must run in, get a ball, dribble it back to their square, go back in, get another ball, dribble it back to their square. And then after a while, when all the balls are gone, coach shouts rob the nest and they can go and rob a ball from every other team so they might rob a ball from the red team if you're yellow they might rob a ball from the blue team they might rob a ball from the orange team and vice versa the others will be robbing from each other and what it's doing is all we're doing is we're working on the dribble we're working on the ball control and again this is where the good kid can sprint the good kid might get 10 balls in a minute and a half the weak kid might just get two balls but they're able to do it in the comfort of knowing they're not being judged they're doing it for their team and the ball that they bring back might be the most important one. That could be the winning, the winning ball. As they get older, uh, or as they get more confident, you can do soloing. So they might have to go in, they might have to roll lift or jab lift and solo. You can use bean bags as well from a younger age if you want to get um, used to the hole in the hurley for the solo. You can also put in a tackle element that you might be allowed to have a guard in each square. So the yellow team can have one person that protects all the balls that come in there. So if a blue person comes over, the blue person has to try to get the ball off the yellow while the yellow is tackling them. So simple things like that, you can adapt to suit the needs of your team. So as you go forward, how else can you link that? How else can we make that harder? So Rob Dinest, as I said, it's a very, very simple game. I use it with junior infants in school. They can do it and they can dribble the ball and they might only use one hand on the hurley and they mightn't be perfect, but they're going away thinking, I can play a hurling. So a game that non-traditional hurling and camogie people might think is very, very hard or camogie and hurling, they're going, oh, you know, I never played it, I wouldn't be comfortable with my kids playing it. And they can see how easy it is for a child to get started. Then it's very important to take it forward like that. So Rob the Nest is another game that the traditional, the traditional game that I'm sure we all would have played or have done at some stage is line up the cones in a straight line and the person has to dribble the ball in and out weaving around the cones. Now we're doing it where the weaving around is going to come from players running across them or it could be a coach in the middle that they've got to go around and they're learning to dribble with the head up as opposed to the head down. So the dribble when you're doing it around the cones, the head is down and they're going in and out around the cones and they're not looking at nobody. Now they've got to dribble with the head up because there's people running in all different directions. There might be people trying to get the ball off them. So we're teaching them skills that are going to replicate to the match a lot sooner. Next game is Croker Run. And again, this is just a ball control, a dribbling game we do in primary schools as well. And we can do it with the junior infants. And uh, this is down for, it's written kind of as a football one here, but it's very simple done as a hurling. It's the same as Bulldog. Every child in the colors would get a ball. I'm the coach in the green. The kids have to go from the line on the six yard box out to the line on the 45, dribbling the ball. So as they get older again, they can be soloing the ball. But from a young age, dribbling the ball, get used to that 
of getting the head up, watching where you need to go. So I'm the coach. I'll try to tackle them. Obviously, I'm a nice coach. I'll let them get through two or three or four times. Um, and the reason I put a coach doing it is because if you put the best kid doing it, they will, they're will they cute enough to go for the weak ones first. They'll take out the child who's probably the beginner, the child who probably needs more of this practice than anybody else, and that child has been eliminated in the very first game. So as a coach, you doing it, you making sure that that weak child gets through a number of times, and then you can start picking off one or two of the kids. And if a child loses the ball, if you do get a ball off the child after the third or fourth run, then that child will become a catcher with you. And all of a sudden, from working on their dribbling, which is which is the head up and watching where they're going and there's loads of people running around, now they're going to be working as a catcher and they're going to be learning how to tackle. And they're going to learn about getting the body the right side of a person that I want to get the ball away. So they're going to learn loads of little knacks. And if the ball is tight between the two of us, can I use my feet to get the ball out? Do I need to dribble the ball away from the opponent? Things like that. So, as I said, with every action we do in Komogi coaching, there is equal and opposite actions of the counter side of it. So if one person is, is dribbling and there's a person tackling, they're getting they're getting the benefits of being an, an attacker and defender and vice versa if they switch around. So again, that's a very, very simple game again that would have been done in and out around the cones, um, weaving in and out and back to your partner. And there'll be three people waiting while one person goes, the good person goes really fast, does it in 20 seconds, the weak person does it in 40 seconds. The group are going, oh, I don't want to be with Mary next time because she's so slow. So Mary is hearing this and Mary is going, Mammy, the girls aren't nice to me and train. So simple things like that, make it a game. Ginny and Mary, they're both there. They're not looking at each other. The good kid is going to fly down there. The weak kid is going to go at their own pace. But as a coach, um, and whether you use other coaches with you, and you might just stay the coaches, it is a good way to do it. And another way of doing it as well, if, if you don't want to put them into the tackling side of things, and you want to do 10 or 12 rounds of the of the dribbling the ball over and back, is have other coaches, but give kids lives that every time they get caught, they lose a life. So they'll get six lives to start off. And if they lose the ball, so if you get the ball off the good player, they're down to five lives, but you never get the ball off the weak player. So all of a sudden the weak player finishes up with six lives and they're going, I like this game. I'm good at Kamogi. So simple things like that uh, make it very, very easy to once they manipulate the kids to think they like it, but try to get them around to the idea that it's important that they can be good at it too. So last game um, that I'm going to show you is Piggy in the middle. And again, this could be done probably, you can do it on ground hurling. Uh, the smallies mightn't get it too well, but the more they do it, the better they get. But you can do it for hand passing. Uh, you can do it for stick passing. You can do it for flicking the ball and stuff like that with probably kids that are a little bit older. But a simple game. They all know how to play Piggy in the middle. And I put in the condition, look, when they are playing it, you're not allowed to um, pass the ball over the person, over the piggy. So if you said that, what does that mean? It means they have to go to the side. So all of a sudden, the kids are going a bit more lateral movement and getting used to, I suppose, adapting to the situation in front of them. Um, I suppose, look, as I said, it's something to probably do more so with the older kids. But as I said, from hurling and camogie, if you want to start off early, uh, dribbling and flicking, stuff like that they might be able to do it and again if you can get a coach to stand in the middle better again because that means that the weak kid isn't going to be in the middle all the time the weak kid is getting a chance to actually execute the skills because we don't want to get to a stage where we want the uh, skill focus is striking the ball and the weak kid who needs who needs it the most is actually standing in the middle trying to block the ball most of the time so be conscious of that especially with the smallies that once they get up just to give them that bit of confidence so we're almost there. Build a player like you build a house. I suppose it's something that I've been taking on board from, I think it was Arsene Wenger, the Arsenal manager, said it years ago. And like a house, you want to put in the foundations first. So the foundations are the introduction to the skill. That's where we're doing the skill at the most basic level, be it ground strike, dribbling, jab lifting, whatever it is. So jab lifting at foundation levels is jab lifting uncontested. And But as I said, rather than doing it out in a straight line, can we just throw all the balls into the area? Right girls go around there and jab lift as many balls as they can in the next minute. They'll go out, as I said, the good kid, they'll get 30 of them, the weak kid might get five. But those five could be very, very important because the next time, let's see if they can get six. So there's no pressure on them except time. There's loads of balls. There's nobody trying to get the ball off them. Next level, once they've got that mastered, you have to start moving on. So rather than doing that game for the next five years, 
we have to move on. How do we make that game next game more important or more challenging? So let's say keep the same confined area that we've got all the balls in the area. We've got 20 yards. The coach now is going to go in and start making life hard. So the coaches, or two or three of them, our parents, we're going to go in and then when a child is going to jab lift, we're going to try to flick the ball away. So a simple thing. All of a sudden now there's a bit of a challenge coming, but it's a control challenge. It's not another child doing it who won't let them do it. We know that if we get the ball and knock it away once, we leave and get it the second time. First floor, we need to raise it again to the next level. Next level might be having a person doing it with an opponent. So Mary and Jenny go together. Mary, you must jab lift as many balls. Jenny, you must stop her. We go for 30 seconds. Mary gets six balls into the hand. That's a good score. Then we go for 30 seconds. Ginny has to try to get six balls into the hand. And again, this is where you can pair them like for like, but the stronger kids with the stronger kids, weaker kids with the weaker kids. So we're executing the skill under pressure. And then we put it into a game that we're trying to execute to get the skill in the game or the match that we're trying to do. So don't be stuck at the same level. We'd see an awful lot of coaches that would do the same activities year on year on year. But every year, if a child can execute a skill how can we make it harder? What can we do to make it a little bit harder for them? And this is where your games come in. So how do we make that game a little bit harder? So was my last thing for tips for coaching children is fun and enjoyment should be the priority. Okay. And I think games will bring that as much as possible. Games more than drills. But as I said, there's a gray area that you might have to modify for some parts of the group or for the whole group to find what suits best. So games are much more enjoyable for kids and that will link into the first one. No queuing. Said earlier on, if we go into a shop and there's five people in one queue and there's one in the other, which queue you're going to join? You're going to join the one. Join the one. And also, if you think about it, when there's messing a training and people say, oh, those three girls, they're always messing they're together. They're messing because they're bored and they've got time to mess. If they're activated in the mind and they're engaged on a ball each, there won't be too much messing. So a small bit of disorder comes from it. And if you've got kids lined up four or five in the line and the back two start messing, then you're taking your eye off what the coaching is and you're dealing with them at the back as opposed to helping the child execute the skill. So limit the cues where possible. Uh, I think Potty Butler used to say back, though it could be a different different mindset now, but I remember back when he was did an introduction with me in Award 1 about uh, 14 years ago, that no more than three in the line uh, or in a group that there should be three, should be the maximum you should have in, in an activity together. No waiting around while they're just playing. So don't have kids waiting when they could be playing. So I know we where when you go into halls and astroturfs, space is limited, but can you keep all the kids activated at the same time? So again, rather than doing drills where there's one person with a ball and two or three people waiting, we want, can we play a game that will keep all the people active at the same time? Age appropriate content, don't be trying to get the under sixes to solo the slitter or hit the ball out of the hand or do a high catch. Treat them as they are with children. They're not mini adults. Give them a content that is appropriate to their age. A happy coach leads to happy players. I suppose it's the put on the clown face that when you arrive, I know most of you, most of the coaches are working nine to five. Busy days, they probably get home, a quick snack before they pick up the child and go down to the pitch because I know the younger age groups always train a little bit earlier and stuff like that. But put on that smile for the hour. The kids can sense the passion and enjoyment from the coach and they will they will react to that. If coach is cranky, coach isn't happy, the kids, the kids can sense that. So put on the happy face, put on the smile, be the clown for the for the hour for the sake of the kids. Uh, they'll appreciate it and it'll make life easier for you. So just put on that smile. Again, fun and enjoyment should be the priority. Uh, don't worry so much about developing the skills and the winning matches and all that stuff. Make sure the kids are enjoying themselves. If they're enjoying themselves, the rest will come, come afterwards. If they're enjoying themselves, that means they keep coming back. If they keep coming back, that means they're going to keep getting better. If they keep getting better, maybe when they get to 18 or adult level, they might start winning the counties that you saw. So I suppose look forward to doing yourself. Um, instruct in the games to individuals. So rather than stopping the whole activity, the game, so we're playing No Man's Land and go, stop, 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 stop. I've seen two people doing this now where they hit the ball wrong and did the wrong hand on top. We all got to get your right hand to hand your right foot on top of the hurley and we start from there. So we're after disrupting the whole activity just because one or two people are doing something wrong. So what we could do and should do in that situation is speak to the individual. So leave the game, keep going. Still balls going over and back playing no man's land. And we're talking to Mary. Mary, 
You're, which hand should be on top of the hurley? Very good, Mary. Good girl. Oh, look at that. Brilliant shot, Mary. Good girl. Something things like that. So rather than stopping everybody and say, kind of singling out people with your, with your, I suppose, criticism in a way or critiquing, we're keeping, we're leaving everybody else play, but we're helping the people that need it on an individual basis. Keep talking to a minimum. I like to go with the power of three, is, as I call it. That's three seconds for every year, their, every year of their age. So if you're working with uh, five-year-olds, 15 seconds. They're gone after that. They're counting crows in the sky after that. So keep it to a minimum. And last thing again, fun and enjoyment should be the priority. As I said, keep them coming back. Keep them enjoying it. The championship wins and all those results will come later in life once they keep coming back. Um, just some other resources that I like to use that on Twitter, you've got John Murphy, um, who does some very good nursery plants and very good fundamental movement activities. Uh, active sports coaching shows some very good games that are not specific to Camogie or hurling or football, but they're very good for athletic development. Help me coach, uh, .ie on Twitter. Physical activity and locomotor movement have absolutely fantastic resources. Owen Mooney on Twitter is very good. Hurling365 in Wexford have a lot of content that they put up and they share. And they got the GA Learning, of course, which, which is provides the, the clips I was showing you around about the drills and stuff like that. Use those because they show them regularly and they're all very good. My own content uh, is available coaching the game at Game Coaching variation of whatever the website has a good number of blogs a number of free resources available there and dropbox and links to dropbox and also um all the books that i've done over the last couple of years are available for free on uh, pdf download on payhip.com and search game coaching and you can download them for free they're they're available um if you want the hard cap the hard copy you can just very limited resources left you can buy them um, but if you want something just to have on the phone which i know most of us coaches now have rather than having books going around with us have the phone pull it out have a screenshot of what the activity is what you're trying to get out of they're all available there's stuff for nursery there's stuff for ball walls and astroturfs there's stuff for youth and adults um and there's just stuff for the kind of go games the 8 to 12 age groups as well so they're all available that's it thanks very much for time um final parting shot would be that there's a black black side of it which is fully games white side of it which is fully drills find the area in the middle which best suits your group and the needs and capabilities of your group and as a coach don't be afraid to have unstructured activities not everything has to look perfect and i know as a coach and i'm sure at some stage in your coaching career you were very conscious of how people would perceive you as a coach, but it's very important that the unstructure, the bit of chaos that you embrace with the kids and the games and a bit of madness and a bit of running around and stuff bumping into each other, that'll all help them become better Komogi players as they go forward. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for watching our Komogi Coach webinar series. And we hope that you have got some insights and practical takeaway ideas that you can bring to your own coaching practice. Our next webinar, Providing Children with a Meaningful Sporting Experience with Barry Milan and Barry Burke, is on Thursday the 29th of October. Until then, keep learning.